Every year, students with disabilities are attending college in greater numbers. As society tries to accommodate the increase, more and more opportunities arise for these students. Students who are diagnosed along the autism spectrum could be those individuals affecting these numbers the most. But these new opportunities bring to light new challenges, uncharted territory for both the student and their professors. Welcome. I'm Michael John Carley, the executive director of GRASP and the author of Asperger's from the Inside Out. I'm Dr. Peter Gerhardt, president and chair of the Scientific Council for the Organization for Autism Research. I'm Kiriana Cowensage, a grad student and a member of GRASP. We're here at Pace University in New York City because the Organization for Autism Research and the Schwally Family Foundation have asked us to give you, the college professor, some idea of the challenges that your student on the autism spectrum might be facing. Challenges that they might be facing not only in your classroom, but also in university life in general, because chances are that if you do have some idea of those challenges he or she may be facing, then you're probably going to play a very pivotal role in whether or not they succeed. By that, what we mean is that when you first meet the person who has an Asperger's syndrome label, you probably won't automatically default to thinking the person has such a significant difference that they would have a disability label. But as you spend time with the person and get to know them as an individual, you'll notice some differences about them, particularly when compared to the rest of your class. They may present with idiosyncratic patterns of behavior. They may present with very intense, very idiosyncratic interests. They may have very specific voice patterns in terms of prosody and tone. But what's common to everybody who has an Asperger's syndrome label is a pretty significant challenge in understanding nonverbal behavior or social nuance. And understanding social nuance really is critical to success both in your classroom and in campus life. Autism is a complex disorder and no two individuals express the same set of traits. Although traditionally classic autism is thought of as a severe language and social impairment, we now know that many individuals are high functioning and have good academic ability. And to emphasize that very point, Kiriana and I were both diagnosed as adults with having Asperger's syndrome and yet we present as two completely different people. So you can see it truly is a very broad spectrum. So why don't we step inside and find that student that's going to need your help so that they can excel within the context of college. So who could be that student with Asperger's syndrome in your class? Well, quite honestly, it could be just about anybody. It could be that student that never stops asking questions, and it could be that student who never asks a question. It could be that student who sits off in the corner all by themselves, or on the flip side, it could be that student who plops themselves down right in the middle of everybody else, thinking they're going to be part of that social circle. It could be that student who makes direct eye contact, never blinking and never flinching when they talk to you, or that student who never makes eye contact. Asperger's syndrome represents a broad spectrum of people, and it's up to the individual and to you to figure out how to best accommodate them within the context of your class for academic success. Now, for your student who may seem to be having difficulties just being in your class, this may be due to what are often referred to as sensory challenges. People with Asperger's syndrome often report being hypersensitive to different sensory stimuli that those of us without the disorder may barely even recognize. This could include sights, this could include sounds, smells, even classroom lighting. A lot of individuals on the spectrum will often report that fluorescent lights are extraordinarily distracting and so may impact classroom performance. So one of the modifications that's extraordinarily reasonable that you can make within the context of your classroom is to work with your student to see where they can sit to minimize these environmental distractors and thereby help them focus on your message of the class that day. Now, in addition to some of the physical accommodations you might be able to make to support your students with Asperger's syndrome, there are a number of academic modifications that you can make. The first and probably most important thing that you need to understand is that individuals with Asperger's syndrome tend to be very literal in their understanding of language. They don't necessarily understand euphemism. Sarcasm is oftentimes wasted on individuals with Asperger's syndrome. So if you really want to provide support, you need to be as clear and direct as possible when interacting with your students on the spectrum. For example, 
Remember the student I mentioned who was raising their hand throughout your entire class? Well, just saying stop that or don't do that so much may not really be enough for them to understand what's expected of them. If you, however, sit down with a student afterwards and say, you know what, other people also have questions and I'm spending all my time answering your questions, so what I want to do is say, in each class, raise your hand twice when you have questions and I'll answer, at least I'll answer no more than two questions each session. Okay, but if you have other questions, come to me after class and we'll talk about that. So that way his needs are getting met because he's getting some questions answered in class and has an outlet. He knows exactly what's expected of him. And you also know that after two questions, you're free to go and talk to other students without worrying about this particular student. There are a number of other accommodations that you really can make. A number of people with Asperger's syndrome present with graphomotor problems, which means that their handwriting is very difficult for them to actually do. So if they have access to a note taker, that would make that part of the lecture that much easier. Similarly, and probably much easier, if they could tape record your lectures. Then they could listen to them later, transcribe them later at their convenience, as opposed to trying to keep up with you as you go through your entire course lecture that day. Access to your classroom notes can be a huge benefit to the learner with Asperger's syndrome, particularly if they get those notes a day or two before. Now they can review in advance, get a sense of what you're going to talk about, so when they're sitting in class, they're really understanding your content as opposed to just the context about what you're speaking. Lastly, and this is actually pretty common, is this idea of extended time on tests, particularly those tests for which the person is going to have to provide essay answers or describe a phenomena. Again, we're getting into some of those language challenges. Quite possibly for a math test where the answer is 3.1497 times 10 to the negative 24th, they might not need extra time. But for language-based tests, there is a real possibility. Lastly, don't get frustrated. Your student is there because he wants to be there, and your student is there to learn. Asperger's syndrome is not a disorder of motivation. If you have a student with Asperger's syndrome in your college class, it's because they deserve to be there. The issue now is to give them the skills so that they can most benefit from your instruction, and that's the key word here. Your feedback to them needs to be in the form of instruction versus criticism. Perhaps the most liberating aspect of university life for individuals on the spectrum is gaining the opportunity to delve into a subject of particular interest to them. Social status is no longer as important in college as it had previously been in high school, so this can be a great relief to individuals with social anxiety. However, it does not mean that challenging social situations won't continue to arise in college, such as noisy parties or other chaotic social scenes. After all, individuals with anxiety may continue to agonize over social mistakes made the night before in class the next day. Another important aspect of college life is learning to live independently, and many individuals on the spectrum can have problems with some basic practical skills like doing laundry or shopping for food. Similarly, in the classroom, other practical skills like taking lecture notes or managing time can also be difficult for these individuals. This is an awful lot of information to digest, we know. But you can take some heart in that none of these students will present all of the challenges that Peter and Kiriana and I are trying to relate to you. There's an idea that might help, and it's sort of a split-level idea in that A, is your student even aware of their diagnosis? And B, how comfortable are they in sharing it with you? Chances are you're going to have a much greater chance at assisting the student who not only knows what they have, but that is comfortable sharing that with the outside world. Ah, now we're inside a library. We've talked an awful lot about some of the challenges that your students on the autism spectrum might be facing, but one of the solutions is to find places on campus where they can feel are safe havens, that there are places to refuel. And libraries are an ideal choice because they're quiet, they have low sensory stimulation, and they're environments where the student can bury themselves in their special interests and the subjects that they feel passionately about. Now, one of the burning questions that you might be asking yourself as you listen to all of this is, what exactly does my college, or me, the professor, have to 
do to accommodate the student with disabilities or the student on the autism spectrum. Peter, the law that pertains to all of this is the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA. What exactly is the student guaranteed under this legislation? Well, Michael, I think it's very important that we understand, first of all, that the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which is sort of the great grandchild of Section 504 of the Vocational Rehabilitation Act, really is civil rights legislation. Okay. It's, it's access law. It guarantees equal access to equally qualified individuals to a variety of services and activities within the United States of America. Um, for example, it's why we have handicapped parking spaces now. Right. Okay? The rub is is that it's the responsibility of that student to know what they need. Once this student has aligned themselves with the Office of Disability Support, with the Office of Students with Disabilities, or the ADA Compliance Officer, it is now their responsibility working with these individuals to develop the plan that will be presented to you, their college professor, in order to meet their classroom needs to succeed academically within the environs of your particular class and course and text demands. It's actually pretty simple when you look at it that way. Okay. Earlier you had mentioned some classroom strategies, the specific accommodations that you're talking about that the student could request. You had mentioned that the student could request to tape record lectures or have material given to them that is written that backs up what is orally presented by the professor. But are there any other suggestions? Well, you know, academic success and success in a professor's classroom goes beyond the 90-minute class. So if there is a student who has an Asperger syndrome label who is struggling academically or just not really meeting their, their expectations academically, you know, one of the things the professor could do is to actually identify other individuals in the class who might be having similar challenges, hook them up with another student who is a little more comfortable with the material and help form a study group. GRASP, as you know, is based on the notion of shared experience and students of the same diagnosis coming together to basically support one another. Is there any way of implementing this idea, uh, this support group model, this peer support, into the college experience? Most certainly. If this is a student who is comfortable with their diagnosis and has aligned themselves with the Office of Students with Disabilities, they will probably be able to have access to other individuals on the spectrum. And this could be a huge benefit to the person on the spectrum throughout their college career. First of all, why reinvent the wheel at every turn? You know, and yes, there may be some generalities that people can say about college life in general, but every college is different. So knowing someone with a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome who's taken a course with this particular professor before and being able to talk to them about their particular challenges, that can be a huge help. And also, just to develop a support network, someone that you could talk to, someone that you could vent to, someone that you can get advice from. And you know, you and I have spoken many times about how when I facilitate support groups for adults with Asperger's syndrome, the advice that comes from somebody else on the spectrum is considered far more valued and far more important oftentimes than the advice that comes from someone like me. So being able to identify other individuals and set up a support group, set up a, a time where you all get together to talk about the challenges, develop strategies, and sometimes just have fun, which really is a big part of what college life is supposed to be about, really can be critical to success outside the classroom. Now, in truth, some offices of student disabilities work harder than others at accommodating their students. And this is something you can't control but you can help your students access the services that exist. The best thing you can do is to help your students help themselves. By helping someone advocate for themselves on behalf of themselves, you're helping someone not just achieve success in your classroom, but quite possibly helping them achieve their dreams. Remember that to become a truly inclusive society that we first have to acknowledge the different challenges that are faced by those who are in the behavioral minority. Because what we're after is the same opportunity for success, not the right to success. Thanks for listening. For more information, you can download a free copy of OAR's Guidelines for College Success or check from their website at www.researchautism.org. Or to learn more about the work of GRASP and obtain a free subscription, you can visit their website at www.grasp.org.